Try to imagine what it would be like if you woke up one day and everything around you was pink. And I mean literally, not just having a think pink vibe. Everything from your walls to your bed, desk, armchair, and even the clothes you wear would be rosy. Would you be able to live in such a world for a whole week? Your first thought might be, is there something wrong with my eyes? For most people, the answer is no. Even if there was something wrong with your vision, the chances are you wouldn't end up seeing just one single color for the rest of your life. Most people who are colorblind are born that way. Even though there are rare cases in which you can develop this condition later in life. And even those people who are totally colorblind see the world only in black, white, and gray. Most people with colorblindness have problems perceiving certain colors. Their greatest difficulty is distinguishing the shades of the same color. But let's get back to our pink world, shall we? Is pink a special color for our brain? When you think about pink objects, you most likely associate them with emotions like love and kindness. In some cases, looking at the color pink for longer periods of time can actually make people feel more agitated. In sports, teams have been known to paint the opposing team's locker room pink in an attempt to decrease their energy and performance. This tactic was implemented by an American coach who believed the all-pink room would mess with the minds of the opposing teams. What if I told you that this specific shade of pink you woke up to had special powers, though? In the 1970s, a scientist named Alexander Schaus found a color that made people feel calm and relaxed. After lots of experiments to test the effects of different colors on people's behavior, he found this specific color which he named the Schaus Pink. His study showed that when people looked at a bright color, they lost strength in their muscles. But when they looked at the color blue, their strength returned to normal. The researcher talked about this in public lectures and even showed it on TV. He invited a bodybuilder and concluded that they could not do a single bicep curl after staring at the pink color. Schaus was so sure of his discovery that he even suggested that prisons should paint holding cells pink to calm people down. Two officers at a U.S. prison tested this idea by painting one holding cell pink and found that some inmates became calmer after being in the pink cell for 15 minutes. In any case, Schaus's original research hasn't been proven to be true by the following studies, but that doesn't mean you can't mm. test it out for yourself. There's no way to tell how your brain might react to living in a pink world for a day, a week, or even a whole month. It all has to do with your previous experience with this color. If it was a happy one, you might actually like living in a pink environment. However, it may be hard on your eyes after a certain point. But we can't say that the colors we surround ourselves with don't affect us. Carl Jung, a famous Swiss psychoanalyst, developed a theory of color psychology, also known as Jungian color theory. He believed that each color meant something different somewhere in the back of our mind and had the power to reveal deeper thoughts. He thought that colors could be used to understand an individual's innermost thoughts and feelings. For example, he considered the color blue to be formal and precise, while green made people feel relaxed and patient. While looking at the color yellow, people became more sociable, and if you liked the color red, it meant you were competitive and strong-willed. Pink isn't the only color people have studied to see its effects on the brain. Let's take green for instance. Would you feel better living in a green world? Well, looking at this color can actually help you focus better. Studies have shown that people who take short breaks to look at pictures of green things, like trees or grass, concentrate better on boring tasks and make fewer mistakes. This is because green is a soothing color that is easy for our eyes and brain to see. I mean, it's the color we often find in nature, so it's no wonder most of us find it soothing. When it comes to red and orange, we should use these in moderation. So, no orange houses for me, thank you. These colors can make you feel more energized and active, but too much can be bad. Researchers concluded that being surrounded by red or orange for long periods of time can make us fussy. Let's not forget about blue. It can make you feel calm and rested, but it can also make you feel gloomy, especially those darker shades. 
waking up in a blue world might come with its own set of problems, depending on the shade. Then, there's the problem with blue light. It's the type of light screens emit. At times, it can be bad for your sleep because such a light can trick your brain into thinking it's still daylight. It can make it hard for your body to produce the hormones you need to fall asleep at the right hours. To avoid these issues, it's a good idea to avoid blue light screens for at least an hour before bed. How about our eyes? Is staring at the same color for longer periods of time any good for us? Not really. If you look at one color for a long time, for starters, it can change the way you see other colors. Back in the day, people used old computer screens that featured a lot of green hues. Because they were exposed to this color a lot during a normal working day, they would see everything with a purple tint for a while after they stopped using the computer. The explanation is simple. The part of the eye that was responsible for seeing green got tired. It got compensated by other parts of the eye that were more rested, those responsible for the red and blue hues. What do you get when you combine red with blue? That's right, purple! These days, most people use computer screens that are white with black letters, so this problem doesn't happen as much. This change in our eyesight is also explained by the McCullough effect. It's a phenomenon that happens when people perceive a change in color of an object after it has been looked at for a long period of time. In 1965, Celeste McCullough found out that if you looked at colorful stripes for too long, it could affect how you saw things for months. Her experiment had people looking at colorful stripes, then at black and white ones. If you do this for long enough, you'll end up seeing the monochrome lines in color too. Just like how a camera flash can make your vision go blurry for a bit, this effect can last for a long time if you look at the stripes for too long. Does the color you stare at make any difference to your eyesight? Well, not really. There is no evidence to suggest that a certain color can trigger the McCullough effect. It's rather caused by a combination of factors, like changes in the way the brain processes visual information, fatigue of the eye muscles, and changes in the way the eye's retina responds to light. What about light? Exposure to some sunlight is important for our well-being, but you've surely heard this one since you were little. Don't stare directly at the sun. Is there really any evidence that it affects our eyes? Or is it just another myth? Turns out, it is indeed dangerous. When you stare at the sun for an extended period, ultraviolet light enters your eyes. It then gets through the internal lens onto the retina and reaches the back of the eye. When this light-sensitive tissue is exposed to UV rays, it can get damaged. You'll end up seeing spots for longer than just a few seconds or even have permanent eyesight damage. This process can happen quickly, even in just a few seconds of direct sun gazing. You ready? Keep track of your points and check your results at the end of the test. 1. If someone made a movie based on your life, what genre would it be? A. A romantic comedy with a happy ending. Love wins. B. A black and white silent movie. I'm that classy. C. Several hilarious shorts. My life is just too funny. D. A superhero movie. I plan to save the world. If you picked A, add 20 points to your score. If you went with B, it's worth 40 points. C brings you 10, and D, 30 points. 2. What is your happy place? A. The library. It teleports me to my imaginary world. B. My house. My family is always there to help. C. Somewhere by the sea. I can tell it about my problems, and it helps. D. In the middle of a crowd. I like observing life. Library fans, you get 40 points. If you prefer your home, you just earn 10 points. If you chose the C, 30 points go your way. Crowd fans earn 20 points. 3. Look around. What color prevails in your room? A. Green or blue. They keep me balanced and help me relax. B. It's a mix of bright colors. I can never choose just one. C. White. Clean, neat, no distractions. D. I prefer patterns to colors.
Option A brings you 30 points, B is worth 10 points, C brings you 40 points, and D is worth 20 points. 4. What would your personal logo look like? A. A lion sitting proudly on a throne. B. A fun unicorn riding on a rainbow. C. Just my initials. I like to keep it official. D. The globe with my portrait on it. I'm a globetrotter. If you picked a lion, add 20 points to your score. Unicorn brings you 40 points. A logo with your initials is worth 10, and the globe gives you 30 points. 5. Which of these animals would you choose as a pet? A. A puppy. I want a fluffy, loyal friend. B. A kitten. Cats are forever. C. A panda. I want to get on TV with it. D. A slow but wise turtle. It reminds me of me. If option A is your choice, you get 10 points. Did you go with B? It's worth 20 points. C brings you 40 points. D is worth 30 points. 6. What is your worst quality? A. I'm too emotional. Work, family, I worry a lot about everything. B. I plan too much. When things don't work out, I'm really sad. C. It's not easy for me to trust people. That's why I can't make friends. D. I don't have a stop button. When I want something, I get it, no matter what. If you picked option A, you just scored 10 points. If you chose option B, it's worth 30 points. C gives you 40 points, and D brings you 20 points. 7. What would you never forgive? A. My best friend lying to me. B. Someone else taking credit for all my work. C. My friends bad-mouthing me behind my back. D. My partner not supporting me and following my dreams. If option A sounds like the way to go, give yourself 10 points. If B is your choice, you just scored 20 points. In case you went with C, it's worth 30 points. Finally, D gives you 40 points. 8. If you had to eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? A. Pizza, pasta, you know, that kind of stuff. B. Some veggies, they're good and healthy. C. I think I'll survive on dessert. D. Junk food for the win. Pizza fans get 20 points. Veggies bring you 40 points. Dessert adds 30 points to your basket. Junk food gives you 10 points. 9. Where do you most often find yourself in your dreams? A. Somewhere from my past. These memories make me smile. B. Some exotic country I've never been to. I love to travel. C. School. I keep getting this nightmare where the teacher calls my name and I'm not prepared. D. On the stage, getting that well-deserved award. Option A adds 40 points to your basket. B gives you 30 points. C is worth 10. And D is worth 20 points. 10. You just got a new computer desk. Will you A. Follow the manual to the letter to put it together. B. Call someone who knows how to do it. C. Experiment. I'll get there eventually. D. Why would I buy a desk? I can build my own. In case you chose option A, give yourself 10 points. B adds 20 points to your score. C is worth 40. And D is a 30-point option. 11. You're moving into a new house. What do you take care of first? A. My bedroom. It's the most important part of the house. B. The living room. I can't wait to throw a party. C. The kitchen. I love cooking, and I can't do it in a mess. D. The backyard. I'll plant some trees and flowers.
A brings you 10 points. B is worth 20, C is worth 30 points, D brings you 40 points. 12. How did you feel when you woke up today? A. Ready to take over the world and full of energy. B. A bit angry. Yesterday's problems are bothering me too much. C. Hmm, can't remember. So, nothing special, I guess. D. Tired as usual. I can never get enough sleep. Option A brings you 30 points. If you went with B, you just got 20 points. If you pick C, add 10 points to your basket. D is worth 40 points. 13. You can't finish a team project on time. What will you do? A. Do my part, hand it in, and see what the boss says. B. Try to come up with a smart solution. C. Blame everyone else and say you did your best. D. Make up a crazy story about why you couldn't finish on time. Option A is worth 20 points. B adds 40 points to your basket. C brings you 30 points. D is worth 10 points. 14. You're hiking with your friends. One of them can't go on to the mountaintop. What would you do? A. Turn the whole group around. B. Split. Some people really wanted to see that view. C. Go there by yourself no matter what others decide. D. Leave that person alone and then come back after them. If you picked option A, you just earned 10 points. If you went with B, add 20 points to your basket. Those who chose C earn 40 points. D is worth 30 points. 15. You must be thirsty by now. Pick a drink to go. A. One smoothie, please. B. Mm, Just plain water. C. I can't live without coffee. D. I'll go with a soda. If you went for a smoothie, here are 30 points for you. Some plain water will bring you 20 points. Coffee fans get 40 points. If you prefer soda, you just got 10 points. Time to sum them all up. If your final score is 150 to 230 points, your personality is green. You're supportive and loyal with exceptional people skills. You can read the emotions of others and spread your positive healing energy. You always find the most original solution to any problem. You feel equally good among people and alone. Did you get 240 to 330 points? Your personality is purple. You're logical, serious, and in perfect balance between your body and mind. You can resolve any conflict, and people come to you for advice. You're naturally mysterious, unique, and incredibly interesting. It draws others to you. You enjoy reading and are really wise for your age. Those who scored 340 to 420 points Your personality is red. Energy and passion are two words that describe you the best. You can lead any project. People trust you and follow your drive. Love and relationships are important to you. You're the soul of any party. Nothing can scare you or stop you. In case your final score is 430 to 510 points, your personality is blue. You're a natural explorer. You never think twice if someone offers to try something new or go to a new place. You live every day to the fullest and don't regret it. You're also a very kind person and will always help a friend out, no matter what it costs you. If you've got 510 points or more, looks like the color of your personality is white. You're an artist at heart. Creating something with your hands or mind makes you the happiest. You might seem shy, but that's because you're always in the world of your dreams. You see beauty in the little things and want to make the world a better place. Nice, huh? Yeah, so few of us. Imagine you just woke up in a world where all the chocolate you can eat is pink. That beautiful, glowy, ruby chocolate instantly creates sparkles in your eyes. And before you know it, your mouth is watering. You grab the pink chocolate between your hands and finally take a bite out of this piece of art. Hmm, it tastes good, but... It doesn't really taste like chocolate. 
There's a widespread debate on whether pink chocolate is the fourth type of chocolate or not. We have dark, white, milk chocolate, and now ruby? Not exactly, but don't worry, we'll understand why. Ruby chocolate appeared on the market in 2017 through a Swiss-Belgian company called Berry Calibut. How they make chocolate pink is a manufacturing secret, but they did open up a little about the process. You might not know this, but it takes a while before you can get from a cocoa bean to a chocolate bar. After harvesting the cocoa pods, one has to dry and ferment the cocoa beans. This process of fermentation is usually what gives the chocolate its rich and complex flavor. Then, you have to roast the beans, which is when they'll acquire the dark chocolate color we're used to. After grinding the beans into cacao nibs, the last part of the process involves melting the nibs into a type of chocolate sauce that will be mixed with sugar, butter, milk, or whatever you wish to mix it with. Some beans are naturally purplish, and they change into a darker color during the fermentation process. But, to make ruby chocolate, manufacturers have to halt the fermentation somewhere in the middle. That's how they preserve some of their original purpleness, which added with a few other secret ingredients, can become pink. If this video is stimulating your taste buds, you can go outside to the nearest convenience store and look for a Ruby Kit Kat. You'll probably notice that pink chocolate has a similar texture to white chocolate, but it has a slightly sour and fruity taste. That's probably due to the fermentation process we just talked about. In case you can't find a pink Kit Kat outside, there's another recipe that gets close enough to the original ruby chocolate taste. According to chocolate expert Angus Kennedy, you can chew on a piece of white chocolate. Add some raspberries and a little piece of milk chocolate. That's more or less what a ruby chocolate bar will taste like. Oh, fun fact, there's also a wide debate on whether white chocolate is actually chocolate or not. Scientists argue that we can't call it white chocolate because it doesn't have any cocoa beans in it. White chocolate is simple cocoa butter mixed with sugar and has some vanilla to add to the flavor. Other studies say that what is legally required to call something chocolate is a simple percentage of cocoa fat. And if that is indeed the rule, well, then white chocolate could be called chocolate, no problem. Anyways, why did pink chocolate get so popular? The thing is that we don't eat only with our mouths. Eating involves all of our senses. The size, shape, color, and surface texture all play an important part in how appealing a food might be to us. The smell will also determine a lot of our eating desires. Crazy as it might seem, the smell of something can already activate your taste buds. But primarily, we eat with our eyes. I mean, look at this beautiful pink chocolate ganache. And this ruby chocolate mousse. It's aesthetically pleasing and looks like you're about to eat one of the colors of the rainbow. Yum! Eating with our eyes has been a reality for us humans since the beginning of time. Let's take our primate ancestors as an example. Science speculates that primates might have developed a trichromatic vision to spot the nutritious and colorful fruits among the dark green canopy. I'm betting that even looking at all these delicious images of food is making you crave the things we're talking about. But our brains aren't all that smart when it comes to eating, and we're easily tricked. For example, if you drink a pink liquid that tastes like a banana, it will take a while for your brain to process it correctly, as your normal expectation is for the drink to taste like strawberry. Another study shows how our brain perceives roughness as a quality of healthy eating even when that's not exactly the case. If I gave you a piece of rough brownies and soft ones and asked you to eat the ones with fewer calories, you'd probably choose the rougher ones. This study from the Journal of Consumer Research shows that foods with rough textures feel heartier and healthier, even if they have the same nutritional value as softer versions. That's why we eat granola bars and trail mixes thinking we are eating super healthy when they are very high in calories. Even today, we are masters at eating with our eyes. Social media stimulates the first thing you do once you order food is to take a picture of it. The prettier the plating and the food itself, the more likes a person is likely to get, and the more a restaurant owner can sell dinner platters. On the bright side, it seems like cuisines all over the world are getting more and more inventive. Have you ever heard of a rainbow bagel? 
The internet was obsessed with this bagel a few years ago, and rightly so. The dough of this pastry looks more like Play-Doh than something edible. But it's a spectacle for the eye and extremely popular amongst young children and adults alike. It's like eating sunshine, one of its admirers says. The brighter the colors, the better in this case. And what about edible everyday items like a hairbrush? I swear this is a cake inside. As much as it might feel weird to eat a hairbrush cake, it's also very cool. This new social media trend is pretty surprising and filled with odd edible items such as edible Polaroid cameras, edible hand soaps, edible water bottles, edible handbags. Really, the list goes on. Acai bowls are also pretty popular today in the social media world. That luscious shade of bright purple topped with perfect rows of granola, pumpkin seeds, and oats makes my mouth water just by looking at it. But cuisine is getting a little bit exaggerated to grasp the attention of consumers around the world. I'm thinking here about Burger King's Quintuple Burger. It's five Whopper patties, five slices of cheese, and five rows of bacon. You get the picture. It's over 2,000 calories in just one burger, which is more or less the nutritional amount an average person needs to consume per day. It's certainly shocking when you look at it. Imagine eating it. Still, our need for food to be aesthetically pleasing has its downsides. In supermarkets, we tend to choose those fruits and vegetables that we consider perfect. But this means that a lot of the ugly food gets thrown in the trash because nobody wants to buy them. Sure, we eat with our eyes, but it's important to be aware that just because a fruit came twisted or weird looking, that doesn't mean it won't meet our nutrition needs. A Singaporean project called Ugly Food is trying to make a difference. People can buy blemished food in their online grocery stores. According to the company, consumers are invited to increase their acceptability threshold. Another project that's changing the meaning of the quote, we eat with our eyes, are restaurants that offer blindfolded dinners. Since 1999, restaurant owners have offered their clients the experience of eating without using their sight. Naturally, this experience heightens the other senses, like taste and smell. A 2002 study also shows that those that eat blindfolded can eat up to 22% less than those that see what they're eating. According to this study, blindfolded people would get satisfied much sooner than those that weren't. This would literally mean that our eyes are bigger than our stomach. Meaning that if the food looks appealing to our eyes, we could be driven to take much more than we normally manage to eat. So, here's how the story goes. This June, a personal chef from Miami called Chef P, with a bit over 800 followers on TikTok, posted a video of her homemade sauce. Yes, this pink one. The key ingredient in the sauce is dragon fruit, which is responsible for its color. The chef claims to have been producing it for her family and friends for years now, and that it is good for anything. In her videos, she mostly uses it as a dip for fried chicken and french fries. The sauce went viral, and now the chef has over 200,000 followers and more than 5 million likes. After the sauce got such raging popularity, on July 1st, the chef launched the sauce for sale, which cost $20 a bottle. Soon after, the drama unraveled. First, some customers got their sauces in plastic bags that had exploded. The chef received complaints, but she handled it with grace, suggesting a refund or a replacement. Still, there was more to come, and people had other questions. They noticed that in P's videos, the color of the sauce varies. It ranges from bright pink to a softer shade of it. P said that some differences are due to different lighting. Plus, the sauce has been undergoing some changes in the recipe, and she was finalizing it, so it has been changing shades a bit. Okay, so it's dragon fruit, but what else is in there? The chef didn't want to reveal the secret recipe, but the initial label of the sauce states water, sunflower seed oil, raw honey, vinegar, garlic, dragon fruit, pink Himalayan sea salt, dried spices, lemon juice, milk, and citric acid. Customers noticed milk on the nutritional label and got even more questions. If it's made of milk, how come it can be stored outside the fridge, especially on hot summer days? An additional complaint is that it's not even stated on the package that the sauce must be stored in a fridge. 
The chef clarified that the sauce is safe to keep outside before it's open, but afterward, it's supposed to be stored in a fridge. The instruction was also later added to the label as well, along with fixing a couple of errors and typos. Milk got changed to dry milk. In one of her videos, Chef P addressed those issues and apologized, explaining that it's a small business that is moving really, really fast. But the mistakes are ongoing, and it's concerning. One user asked the chef during Q&A if the sauce was FDA, Food and Drug Administration, approved, which completely baffled the TikToker, who said that she was selling food, not medical products. This lack of awareness caused additional mistrust and negative comments. While in the state of Florida, it is legal to sell food products without a permit if the sales don't exceed $250,000 annually. So everything the chef does is in accordance with the law. Still, those issues are yet alarming. As of now, Chef P continues working on her sauce, doing some lab testing, and developing her own brand, and hoping to launch it for production and sales in stores. Still, Chef P's perspective is understandable. She makes her own product she believes in and is now struggling with demand and time pressure. The pink sauce isn't the only product TikTok made people buy. There's a whole bunch of stuff that ran out of stock because of its crazy popularity on TikTok in particular. A sky-high mascara, a cleaning paste called Pink Stuff, a prep deck kitchen organizer, and even roller skates thanks to countless girls rollerblading all over TikTok. There's even a popular hashtag, hashtag TikTok made me buy it, which has more than 25 billion views. This is successful because there are actually non-sponsored reviews from real people, so they're more reliable and have better trust. Also, those products are often inexpensive gems since it's regular people like you and me who are using them. TikTok doesn't only blow up products, it also blows up people. Remember Chef P, who went from 800 followers to 200k in a matter of days? There are many more TikTok-made micro-influencers who used to be regular people, but gained followers after some of their content went viral. TikTok also blows up songs. Many tracks go to the top on Billboard because they went viral on TikTok. Songs often become hits on TikTok even before their official release. Many artists now release a part of a song on TikTok, creating demand for it even before the release. They go viral, there are dances associated with them, and the audience is hooked for a full song to come out. Social media is designed to be addictive, and there are tricks different platforms use to keep your attention. The fastest growing social platform these days is TikTok. It was only launched globally in August 2018, but it has already been downloaded 3 billion times. It has 1 billion active users, and those numbers are still growing. Even though more and more adults keep joining the platform, it is still mostly used by teens and young adults, making it a social platform with one of the youngest audiences. Also, people spend more time on TikTok than any other social media platform. That is 45 minutes a day on average. TikTok's history started in September 2016 when a Chinese startup company launched the app in China under the name Douyin. It was a video sharing service that was an alternative to Facebook and Instagram, which are banned in China. A year later, the company bought a social media app called Musical.ly, an app with short dancing and lip syncing videos. They ported the 200 million Musical.ly accounts to Douyin and incorporated some of the app's features. A year later, in 2018, the company launched the global version of the app, changing the name to TikTok. There are several secrets to the platform's success. Firstly, the videos are short, so you don't have time to get bored. It's a scientific fact that the attention span has been decreasing over the generations. The attention span of Gen Z, people born between the mid-1990s and the 2000s, is just 8 seconds. YouTube videos, for example, are way longer and require a lot more concentration than short TikTok videos, which are more easily digestible. Second, TikTok adopted a whole different approach than other social media platforms. Notice that the primary page you enter on Facebook or Instagram is the home feed, a bunch of posts from the pages you follow. TikTok's primary page is the For You page, or the page with suggested material. 
The page gives you more of what you engage with by giving you likes, sharing, saving, and writing comments. So other than giving you what you ask for like other social media does, it gives you what you react to. Soon enough, your For You page becomes heavily customized, each video having a high chance that you will like it, and this is why it's so addictive. Also, TikTok is great at building a sense of community and driving engagement. The duet function allows every user to build up on the existing, often already popular video. Filters and audio tracks are also community-owned, meaning that anyone can use them and make their own video, hopping onto trends and viral sounds, and making their own content out of that. One of the problems old Musical.ly had back in the day was that videos were being downloaded and sent out on other social platforms, and no one would know where the original was coming from. So, TikTok always adds a watermark to the video, driving traffic to the platform. Researchers say that social media, TikTok included, work like a slot machine. Every time you refresh the page, it gives you something new. This mechanism is addictive as well. Users can't predict what's going to come next, so they keep pulling a slot machine lever, or a refresh in our case, hoping that the next video will be the one. Now, if someone asked you to name the most common colors, you'd probably likely go with red, green, and blue. Yet until modern times, your ancestors didn't realize blue was a color at all. Back in the 1800s, British scholar William Gladstone noticed that in his famous odyssey, Homer didn't use the word blue at all. He even called the ocean deep red. Homer described clothing, armor, human faces, and animals in detail. But all the colors were somewhat messed up. Iron and sheep were violet, and honey, green. Black was mentioned in the book 200 times, white around 100, and red, yellow, and green less than 15 times each. It was the same in other ancient Greek writings. The word blue didn't exist at all. Gladstone thought that the monochrome way of seeing the world was something typical for the ancient Greeks. But some years later, his followers continued with the research, and they found no mention of blue in other cultures either. Ancient Icelandic sagas, Chinese stories, Arabic and Hindu texts, all of them avoided blue even when they talked about the skies. It turns out the first people that used the word blue to describe this color were the Egyptians. They also happened to be the only people that produced blue dyes. Well, that's probably why there's no mention of the ancient Greeks or any other ancestors singing the blues. Did I make that up? I did. Now, it may sound strange, until you realize the only thing in nature that looks blue is the sky. There aren't that many blue animals or blue flowers in the wild. And blue eyes used to be even rarer in ancient times than they are now. That's why almost every language first developed the words for black and white, then red, yellow, and green. But just because there was no name for the blue color doesn't mean our ancestors couldn't see it at all. This color just didn't stand out to them. There's a tribe in Namibia called Himba. They still don't have the word for blue. They also don't distinguish between green and blue. They have something like Gru instead. When they were shown one blue and 11 green squares, they struggled to find the odd one out. But they have more words for the shades of green than there are in most other languages. That's why the tribe members found the slightest differences in the shades of the green squares in no time. When Russian speakers are shown different shades of blue, they can pick out lighter and darker ones way faster than English speakers. This is because they use separate words for light blue and dark blue rather than just one universal word. Where you live can change the way you perceive colors. For example, the Greeks who have lived in the UK for a long time often consider light blue and dark blue one color. But in Greece, they normally use two separate words for them, like in Russia. The way you perceive colors isn't just about seeing what's out there. It's more about how your brain processes what you see, which means it's very subjective. Some people even see colors as letters and numbers, or hear them. Those who live closer to the Arctic Circle can name different shades of snow because that's what they see all the time. To others, it's just white. Some languages only have general names for colors. For example, dark stands for cool hues like black, blue, and green. 
Colors like white, red, orange, and yellow are all called warm. Your eye processes more variations of warmer colors than cooler ones. There's a tribe in Australia who describes texture, the function of an object, and how it feels instead of color. They don't have any names for colors at all. The Kandoshi, who live on the banks of the Amazon River in Peru, don't have a word that would describe the very concept of color. Instead, the name of some yellow bird will be used to describe the yellow color. Any ripe fruit will stand for red and unripe fruit for dark green. The English language didn't have the word for orange until the 1500s. That's when someone brought the first orange trees from Asia to Europe. Until then, the hue was called yellow-red. Sir Isaac Newton was the one to name the colors of the rainbow – red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. He noticed these hues after watching a beam of light pass through a triangular prism. The initial white light was split into seven colors. When you look at an object, millions of light receptors in your eyes send a message to your brain via the optic nerve. Some of these receptors are shaped like rods, and others like cones. Newton said that objects weren't actually colored. It was their surface that reflected some colors and absorbed others. When an object reflects all wavelengths, the thing looks white. When it absorbs them all, it looks black. An apple looks red because it reflects red wavelengths and absorbs all the rest. That's why objects may seem to change color depending on what's next to them or in different lighting conditions. The human eye has three types of cones. These photoreceptor cells distinguish between red, green, and blue wavelengths of light. Each type is responsible for about 100 different shades. Altogether, they let you see 1 million colors. About 1% of people have a fourth type of cone. It gives them a superpower of distinguishing between 100 million shades of different colors. Ooh. About 8% of men and 1% of women have color deficiency. That's because they're missing some cones or have bad ones. Most of them don't even know about it, as some colors have always looked identical to them. The most widespread kind of such deficiency is when you can't tell red from green. A lot of people lose their ability to perceive colors as they get older. By around age 70, their eye lenses become yellowish. This natural yellow filter they look through doesn't let them tell blue from purple and yellow from green. Half your brain is hardwired to process visual information. A much smaller part of it is left to perceive flavor. That's why the color of a food or drink can boost or curb your appetite. You'll always choose the reddest apple because your brain perceives it as the sweetest and ripest. There are no naturally blue foods, so you're least attracted to them and can even fear them. That's why installing a blue light in your fridge or eating from blue plates is a great way to eat less. You'll always choose brighter fruits and vegetables because they're associated with a richer flavor. Eating them makes you feel healthier and happier. Yellow can boost your appetite as you associate it with energy and excitement. White can trick you into eating more and paying less attention to what you're munching on. That's because white food seems more harmless in terms of calories. If you eat from a white plate, you're more likely to overeat as it makes food look brighter. Your brain also remembers the color of food wrapping. If you put salt and vinegar chips into a cheese and onion package, you might not even notice the difference in flavor while snacking on them. Food companies know you'll eat more of whatever they're selling when it comes in different colors and flavors. Curiosity or search for your favorite taste won't let you stop. Colors that surround you in the office affect your productivity, creativity, and mood. Blue helps you focus. It's an intellectual color that stands for logic and efficiency. Red gives you courage and strength for physical work. Yellow makes you happier and more productive and confident. Green brings balance and harmony to the office environment. Your eyes also love this color. They don't need time to adjust to it. Orange gives you a sense of comfort and warmth, so it's perfect for an office lounge. Birds, fish, and many mammals see the entire color spectrum in all its glory, just like humans. For some animals, good color vision is crucial. Without it, they won't tell ripe red fruit from unripe green fruit. 
But some insects, like bees, also perceive ultraviolet colors that your eyes can't see. Jumping spiders have eight pairs of eyes. The biggest of them provide the creatures with high-resolution vision. They also have a broader spectrum of colors than humans and special pigments that can perceive ultraviolet light. Bulls are partially colorblind and can only see yellow, green, blue, and violet. They don't have the red retina receptor, so they can't see red. Ah, so much for that cape thing. Dogs have two types of color-detecting cones, one type fewer than humans. They can perceive yellow and blue to ultraviolet light. Your cones work great in relatively bright light, and your rod cells help you see in dim light. But in this case, everything around looks like shades of gray. Unlike humans, geckos have perfect night color vision. It's 350 times better than yours. Garden snails can't focus or see color at all. They manage to navigate towards dark places thanks to their ability to feel and analyze the intensity of light. Just like fingerprints, your eye color is unique. It can even affect the way you perceive light and make your vision one of a kind. To understand how this is possible, you gotta figure out how the eye color is formed. This is the iris, the colored part of the eyeball. The iris contains pigmentation, and its content determines what eye color you have. Every human has a slightly different amount of pigmentation. That's why you won't find two people with identical eye colors. Three specific genes in your body are responsible for melanin levels and determine pigmentation. Blue and green-eyed people have less melanin in their iris. And those who have more melanin have darker eye colors, like brown and hazel. Some rare people have beautiful deep black eyes, but this is only an optical illusion caused by the abundance of melanin. Pure black iris doesn't exist in nature. Although these eyes look very dark, they're actually dark brown. Studies have proved that eye pigmentation impacts your vision. No matter how dark or light your eye color is, people with lighter eye colors are more sensitive to light, which may cause them to feel uncomfortable on sunny days. If you have light eye color and have to squint when you go outside, don't forget to put on sunglasses. Your irises contain less pigment that serves as protection from the sun's rays. But since melanin acts like natural sunglasses, you have better night vision compared to dark-eyed people. On the contrary, if you have darker eye color, your eyes can cope with bright light better during the daytime. Dark-eyed people should feel more confident while driving at night because they don't get blinded by car headlights that much. But that's no reason to throw away sunglasses. You still need them to protect your dark eyes from UV rays. The most unusual and rarest eye color is red. Usually, albinos carry this rare feature because their irises are transparent due to the lack of melanin. Blood vessels give a reddish tint to the eyes. And in some cases, the red mixes with the blue color and creates a beautiful and extremely rare purple color. Of course, such eyes need careful protection from bright light. Your eye color probably also impacts your sports performance. Researchers from the University of Louisville claim that blue and green-eyed students perform better at self-paced tasks in games like golf, bowling, or billiards. Dark-eyed students do better at reactive tasks such as defense or hitting a ball. Estimates suggest that only 8% of people in the world have blue eyes, but this eye color is the most common at birth. Usually, melanin develops over time until it reaches the full adult amount of pigment. That's why your eye color can change over time. But not the size of the iris. Unlike your face and most body parts that change significantly during your life, the eyes and iris have one stable size and shape, no matter how old you are. The average diameter of the iris amounts to 0.5 inches. It's extremely rich in all sorts of ridges, specks, rings, and folds, which are established genetically. Usually, the pattern of the iris doesn't fully form until the age of two. These patterns are really unique. Even the pattern in your left eye is different from your right eye, as well as from anyone else's eyes on the planet. The inability to distinguish colors, also known as color blindness, affects around 8% of males and 0.5% of females. But colors themselves aren't as stable and objective as they might seem. Multiple tests have shown that people experience colors differently, depending on many factors, such as geographical location, language, and gender, to name a few. It means you can enjoy the same sunset with your friend and see completely different colors without even knowing it. A human mouth is pretty unique as well. 
You won't find two identical sets of teeth even among identical twins. That's because the shape depends on how each person is using the jaw. Even the tiniest habits you used to have many years ago, such as lip biting, affect the formation of your teeth and the uniqueness of your dental impression. You've probably noticed that lipstick prints on a napkin or a mirror are always slightly different depending on who left them. Studies of both females and males revealed that lip print patterns for each individual are unique. They didn't reveal any special traits based on the gender factor. So, this individual pattern of the tiny folds on your lips is one of your major biometric signatures. The tongue is one of the strongest muscles in your body, and its appearance is unrepeatable. This organ contains more than 10,000 taste buds, and each bud is filled with microscopic hairs. Their job is to sense your food, distinguish tastes, and send information to your brain to initiate the appropriate digestion process. During your life, all those tiny bumps and ridges on your tongue create a special individual pattern. That's why experts say that tongue prints are as unique as fingerprints. Perhaps in the future, when this topic is better investigated, tongue biometrics will become a common thing. This doesn't seem to be the most convenient way to verify your identity, though. Each human has a unique voice formed by many factors. They include the full history of how you've learned to speak and sing, the length of your vocal tract, and the way you use your voice every day. Although some talented actors can perfectly fake the voices of different people, including celebrities, special computer technologies can still determine the difference. Palm prints are as unique as your fingerprints. Over the years, the lines may change, appear, and even disappear, but the pattern itself, with all its tiny details, remains your unique personal signature. Your fingerprints don't match your toe prints. You have 10 completely different fingerprints and 10 different toe prints. Each toe is different from all your other fingers and toes. This amazing variety of patterns develops before birth while you're in the stage of a fetus. The shape of your outer ear gets fully formed by the age of 10. Ears may grow larger as you age, and gravity can make them sag a little bit. Female ears tend to have a smaller size compared to males. But still, the shape of your ears with all their bumps and ridges remains so unique that biometrics experts consider this body part one of the best ways to identify personality. They use special software to scan and recreate the scale and position of an ear. These studies have revealed a 99.6% accuracy, just like the good old fingerprints. Gait analysis is another biometric technology to identify people. Your gait is shaped by many factors from your birth to the present day. This includes the way you sleep, stand, walk, run, and pretty much all the body movements you've ever made. The gait is unique simply because each person's fate is unique. Of course, it's quite difficult to distinguish the individual features of one's gait without special training. But you'll probably recognize the footfall of your best friend or spouse even if your eyes are closed. Your fingers have plenty of receptors responsible for sending messages to the brain. They're as sensitive as your eyes. That's why people have invented so many myths around hands. One of them is about the ring finger on the left hand. It says that people should wear wedding rings on the fourth finger of the left hand because it contains a special vein that carries blood from the left hand straight to the heart. It's called vena amoris. Unfortunately, experts have debunked this romantic myth. All your fingers are equally special since the network of blood vessels in your hands is pretty much similar. The belief originated in ancient Egypt in the western part of the planet adopted this wedding custom. In many countries such as India, Denmark, Norway, Russia, and Bulgaria, people prefer to wear wedding rings on the right hand.